Somebody say I'm positioned for victory. Tonight is going to be a huge turning point in your life. I want to talk to you about amen. Give God praise, please. Go ahead. Yes, Lord, we give you the glory. It's, uh, he's leading me tonight to share with you on what I call how to escape the danger of positive distractions. Positive distractions. I want you to keep standing as we read together the book of Isaiah chapter 50. Positive distractions. Isaiah chapter number 50. I want to read verse 7. Isaiah 50 and verse 7. Mm-hmm. Tell somebody, mm-hmm. Say it again. Say, mm-hmm. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 50, we want to read verse number 7. Music out, please. Isaiah 50 and verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. I want somebody to say amen to that. If I were you, I will say amen to that. Amen. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. I love those scriptures that come so strong in my face. They come like a blessing in my face. I don't know about you. When I'm, I just opened the Bible, when I was studying, and, and God led me to the scriptures, and it came in my face. Boom. For the Lord God will help me. I, I staggered to the back. I said, that's my word. Because I can do with some help right now. I can use some help from the Lord right now. Anybody can use some help from God right now? I want you to look in that scripture and say, For the Lord God will help me. Say it again with faith. Say, The Lord God. Okay, you don't know what I'm talking about. But as I'm speaking now, God is sending the host of heaven, the angelic forces on assignment to help you. Now, somebody don't believe that. I said, God, oh, Jesus, help me tonight. I feel the anointing. He's sending the host of heaven. In other words, the things in your life that you cannot do or obtain or accomplish by yourself. The Lord says, tonight, I am sending on assignment the angelic host to help you. Somebody say it again. Say, the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a fleet. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. Verse 8 the Bible says in his near that justifieth me. God justifies me. The Bible says in the book of Romans. He says who shall lay a charge against the law's elect. In other words, you need to understand that God has justified you. To justify means to acquit you of wrongdoing, to declare that you are free, though you had done something wrong, but somebody had, hallelujah, advocated for you, and they have, hallelujah, I'm nullified the penalty of the consequences of your wrongdoing. So you are living in justification. Somebody need to hear that again. In case the enemy is trying to dig something from your past. I'm talking to somebody. In case the spirit of condemnation, the spirit of fear, the spirit of guilt, is, is, is trying to dig something from your life, you tell the devil, shut your mouth for the Lord has justified me. If I were you, I'll say loud, amen. amen. For the Lord God, he is near that justified me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lord, they all shall wax old as a garment. The mold shall eat them up. Let me hear you say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. I want you to understand that the anointing that God is placing over your life empowers you to accomplish unique and significant things in the earth realm. The man that God has anointed, the woman that God has anointed, is a man on a mission. You are a man on a mission. The man anointed by God is a man on a mission. The woman anointed by God is a woman on a mission. Most people are living what I call reactive life. A reactive lifestyle means they are going through everyday life reacting to the events of their lives. Whenever the anointing comes on your life, one of the things the anointing of God does 
The anointing enables you to live a proactive life. What is a proactive life? A proactive life means a life by design. You understand the blueprint of your destiny. And because you understand the blueprint of your destiny, it becomes clear to you that you cannot do just anything. In fact, you cannot just that. You, can, you can't just do everything. You can't do everything. Not one person can do a whole lot, but you are called to do specific things. And the anointing enables you to know the specificity of your assignment. This is what God has actually called me to do. You know what God has called you to do in detail. You're a man and a woman on a mission. You have to get out of bed every morning knowing that you are a woman on a mission. Some people are living or merely existing to fulfill the mundane needs of life. They go from their job to doing other menial things and other activities of life. But they never truly understand the proactive dimension of the anointing. The anointing makes your life to be intentional. The anointing makes your life to be deliberate. The anointing makes your life to be geared towards an eternal purpose. You begin to understand what you are called for. See, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, he spelled out his mission statement. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And Jesus started to highlight what God had anointed him to do. Do you know that at a time in the ministry of Jesus, because he had fed people with bread and with fish, the Bible says they came and they wanted to make Jesus a political leader. Scripture says they wanted to make him their king. That's the word of God said Jesus wixed himself away from the midst of them. It was a good thing, it was a noble thing for somebody to be elected into political office. But Jesus Christ understood that to be appointed as the leader and the king over Israel was not his assignment. It was a place of celebration. But it's just not what I'm called for. I'm not called to be your king. I'm called to be the savior of the world. I'm, I'm talking to somebody tonight. It was a good thing, but it's not God's purpose. The anointing on your life helps you to distinguish between what is good and what is God's will for you. Okay, I'm talking about good things. I'm not talking about bad things. If you're still dealing with bad things, you still have to choose between what is good and what is evil. You are still a baby. If you're still grappling between, oh, do I do God's will or do the devil's will, you are still a baby. When you grow to a point in your work with God, your choices... Or your preference is no more between what is good and bad. It's between what is good and what is God's will. Am I talking to somebody? And you're going to get to a point whereby your choices is not only between the parameters or within the parameters of what is God's will. But even what is the perfect will of God. Because some things could be permissive will of God. But certain things are perfect will. As you grow in your walk with God, you are not only seeking to please God, but you are seeking to operate and to walk in the perfect will of God. Because the anointing on your life is very definite. And that anointing requires that you function, I want you to hear me, in a specific place, for a specific purpose at a specific time with a specific person. Jesus understood that. The Bible says one time Jesus stood. He was by the well and he sent away his disciples. What was Jesus doing? He was waiting for the Samaritan woman. It had been preordained by God that the woman would walk to that well that day. Jesus was waiting for that woman. You need to understand that your anointing requires that you don't go any kind of place. Your anointing requires that you are walking in precision with the will of God. 
And when that woman came and the, and the transaction and the conversation that went on between Jesus and that woman, he let us know that that woman was a part of God's plan for that day. Let me say something to you. You are knowing that to be on a mission. Some of you are knowing that to heal sick people. You are known to speak live to somebody in the, in the morning. You are known to be a business owner. You are known to do specific things. You, I'm, I'm known to do something specifically at every given time. And one of the grace God has given me is early in my life, I found out the specificity of my assignment. Where shall I be? Where shall I go? What is God calling me to do? And I have navigated my life with this revelation. I want you to know something, child of God. One thing, every single day of your life, every single season of your life, every single step of the way, one thing is always needful. Many things are going to come up in your way every single time. But man of God, I've come to understand that only one thing is important for you to accomplish at every single dimension of your life. One thing, the Bible says Jesus went to the house of Mary and Martha. And, and, and you know, there was a whole lot of things that could be happening in that atmosphere. Because Jesus was a VVIP, very, very important personality. And he was visiting their home maybe for the first time. And guess what? Maybe there was a lot of people out there as well. And Mary decided to be doing what? The cooking. Was it Mary doing the cooking? Mary was Martha, pardon me. Martha was doing the cooking because they had Jesus, a special guest in the home. She said, I gotta make him happy. I gotta make sure that the house is suitable for Jesus. I have to make sure that Jesus Christ is a welcome and honored guest in our home. And I had to get the food ready. But the Bible says Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And 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 then the, the Bible says the work was so heavy for Martha that she said to her, Why don't you tell my sister to help me, Lord? Why is my sister sitting at your feet and you cannot even tell her to help me? And Jesus said, Listen, Martha, one thing is needful. One thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that part, and nobody would take it from her. One thing is needful. Every single day of your life, the enemy will put things in your way. People are going to put things in your way. Circumstances of life will put things in your way. Let me say something to you. No matter how powerful you are, you cannot do what everybody wants you to do. You cannot be everywhere everybody wants you to be. You cannot accomplish everything that is before you every day. But you've got to understand one thing is needful. And in the eyes of the Father, the moment that you accomplish what is needful, what is needed for you to accomplish, he's going to open you up to the next dimension. Am I talking to somebody right now? So anointed people, they do not do too, too many things. They don't do everything. They only do what is expected of them. I want somebody to ask the Lord, say Father. Say it again. Say Father. Say Father. Show me one thing that is expected of me to accomplish your will for my life in this season. There's something God expects you to be doing. There's a missing link to the next level. You got to understand it. And you, you can do 50 things and not do what God called you to do. I might talking to somebody right now. You can do 50 good things and not still do what God wants you to do. One thing is needful. A lot of things are going to come your way. But you got to know one thing is needful. I want to retrace back my thought. Number one, I said to you, the anointing calls you for a purpose. And the person that God has anointed is a man or a woman on a mission. And I said to you that the person that God has anointed, they understand that one thing is always required of them. And that is God's will. And God's will is not two. It's one. God's will is one. He calls you to do something. You know, sometimes in a day, God wants me to do only one thing. And he says, this has been a successful day. This has been a great day for you. Because there's so many things on your table every time. But as long as you're walking in the will of God, the next door is going to open to you. Number four things I want you to understand is that anointed people, they do not do middle ground. You cannot be anointed and be doing middle ground. You are called 
to go all the way. Let me hear somebody say all the way. We are anointed to stand to the end. We are anointed to stand with God. The Bible says in the book of Revelations chapter 3, he said, I wish that you were neither hot nor cold, but because you are lukewarm. God says, I will spew you out of my mouth. See, the problem is, too many times we have a lot of people who start with God, but they can't end. We have a lot of people who find the middle ground. And I say to you every time that there are certain words you will not find in your Bible. That God is using to express himself. And, and one of those words is perhaps. God never say maybe. He never says perhaps or probably. You never hear God say, well, I might be with you, but I don't ever know about it. Or you might hear God says, well, if, if you like, be born again. And if you like, don't be. It's entirely up to you. Whenever God is speaking, he says, verily, 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 surely, assuredly. He said, hear it and hear it again. It is the truth. It is unchangeable. God is not looking for people who are going to do middle ground. God is looking for people who are going to go all the way. All the way. You know, I love the way Jesus puts it. He said, if anyone wants to follow me, you want to be my disciple. Jesus said, let him first deny himself. And then let him take up his cross and let him follow me. Let him first deny himself and then let him take up his cross and let him follow me. God is looking for people who are going to be intense in their walk with him. People who have a desire to please God by any means necessary. He's looking for somebody, if you're going to pray, he wants you to pray with fire. If you're going to connect with God, he wants you to do it. A whole lot of people are like, oh, he's too loud. Your prayer is too intense. Take it easy. No, God does not do middle ground. He wants us to go with him all the way to the very end. The army of the Lord that God is raising now, he's raising the army of people who are very, very intentional, who are very intense in their work with God. Let me hear you say amen. amen. You also have to understand, child of God, that the Father is calling you to understand how to protect the integrity of your spirit. I want you to say this, I'm going to say protect. The integrity of your spirit. Look at my somebody. Why do you have to protect the integrity of your spirit? Because whenever God gives you an assignment, the number one goal of the devil is to distract you. And a lot of people believe that distractions usually mean something that's wrong in that context. Something that's evil coming out of the ordinary to take you off course. And the devil does that. But when you mature to a point in God, the devil does not particularly use those kind of things to bait you away. Because many of us are not careful for those things that seem positive, but they are not within the parameters of God's will. So we fall for what I call good distractions. And you got to protect the integrity of your spirit. This is very, very crucial. Look at my eyes, somebody. Many times, how do I distract you? How do I distract you? How do I keep you from doing what you're doing? I just give you something else. I just give you something else to do. And because you cannot do two things at once. I said that already. You got to understand you can only do one thing. And the enemy does what? He gives you something else. And when he takes your eyes away from what you're meant to be doing, and he puts in you something else that's not related to that perfect will of God. What happens? You are already occupied. But occupied doing the wrong things. Occupied doing what is not related to your own assignment in God. Many are occupied doing beautiful things that is not God's will for them. Things that are very nice. Things that make you appeal to people. But it's not God's will for your life. And that's why I said you must protect the integrity of your spirit. I want you to hear me. 
Because God will speak to you specifically in your spirit about his assignment for your life. Okay. And when God speaks to you, there will be times in your life that opportunities will present itself that does not align with that assignment. And some of those opportunities will seem like beautiful things, but it's not God's will. Oh, I'm speaking to somebody tonight. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 50, I set my face like a flint. You know what a flint is? It's that rock, rock that is so hard. I've set my face like a flint and I shall not be confounded. If God is calling you to do something significant, he wants you to first understand it. Understand your assignment. Understand your mission. Understand what you are called to do. And the moment that your mission is clear to you, God says to tell somebody today, own it and embrace it and set your face like a flame. And that's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And, and, and that means that Jesus is the beginning and the end of our faith. What God starts in you, God does not want it to stop halfway. God wants you to finish your assignment. Amen. Come on, tell somebody, I will. Finish. Come on, say it with faith. Say, I will. Amen. Say like the devil need to hear that. Say, I will. Amen. Finish my assignment. Say, I set my face like a friend to do the will of God. Let me hear you say amen. amen. You have a responsibility to protect the integrity of your spirit. I want to say to you that many times in my life, there's been many times that things will come into my life that seem like it is something really, really nice. And some of them look very important. Some of them even come from people that I respect. But I know it would take me away from what God was calling me to do. Some of them even seem like opportunities that will make money for me. But I know that it would take me away from the overall goal and the objective of God for my life. I want you to hear this child of God. You have to embrace your calling. You have to embrace your destiny because God said it. Not because it is lucrative or not. You have to understand that I'm doing what I'm doing because the Lord has called me to do it. Because when God calls you to do something, there will be future at the end in what you're doing. Oh, come on. Am I talking to somebody? If the Lord has spoken to your spirit and you feel a conviction in your belly, to be doing something for God. You better stick to it. Because sometimes. It will look like. Certain things in, in, in other people's lives. Seem better than what God called you to do. Well, am I talking to somebody tonight? It looks like you got it all put together. Why am I doing this and you're doing that? Why, why, am, why are you making all that success and I can't even break up one, one, one thing even where I am? It is because the Lord has called me to do this. And that's why I said protect the integrity of your spirit. Because every time God is calling you to do an assignment, he, he downloads that assignment into your spirit. Your spirit can tell you this is where I ought to be now. This is where God wants me to be. This is what God wants me to be doing. This is how God wants me to be doing what he's called me to do. And I'm stuck to do the will of God. You know, many years I told one of my friends, I'm talking about way many years, I said, even if I was invited to be the chaplain of the White House, I would say no. And I was saying that with a sense of seriousness. Why? Because I understood what my assignment in this life is. Am I talking to somebody? I got it early. What God is calling me to do in this house, in this place, I knew it for sure. And I said to my friend, 
I'm so certain of where God wants me to be that if I was invited <laughs> to be the chaplain of the White House and be the private pastor of the president, I will still say no because I'm aware of my assignment. And that's why many people, they flip in and they flip out every time. Then you know why they flip out? Because they don't know for sure where God wants them to be. And then they embrace everything that's selling. They embrace everything that's in vogue. But once your spirit captures a vision from God, the Lord will require you to commit yourself and not allow anything to take your eyes away from what God has called you to do. If that person is here, say yes, Lord. He's asking me to come here and say to somebody, do not look out for negative distractions. Those are easy to identify. But open your eyes for those things that the enemy will bring your way to make you lose focus and to forget entirely what your own assignment is. Because I say something to you today. If you do not take away your assignment, your eyes rather, from the assignment that God has called you to do, it does not matter. Glory to God. If it's not being fruitful today, it will bear fruit tomorrow. If it's not being celebrated now, it's still going to be celebrated. People will come around to see hallelujah the reward of God's faithfulness when you stay put for what God has called you to do let me hear you say amen to that the father is looking for people that he can take on the long road and why is God looking for people he can take on the long road because God does not do 100 meter race am I talking to somebody right now God does not do what the Bible says precept shall be what? Upon precept. And line upon what? Line. And here a little and there a little. God does not do 100 meter race. When God is calling you, he's not calling you only to give you A level blessing. He wants to give you Z level blessing. Author and the finisher of your faith. Am I talking to somebody? When God is blessed calling you, he's not calling you so that he can meet your present need. And oftentimes we are concerned or we are overwhelmed by what we are dealing with in our lives right now. And we can't see beyond this present level. But God says, I orchestrated your life and I know your need from the beginning to the end. I know your need in the next five years, seven years, 12 years, 15 years, 30 years, 40 years and beyond. And all of the blessings that you need, I have already packaged everything into your assignment. So when you understand that following God all the way is what gives you advantage in every phase and every level of your life. Where you have not been, he's taken care of it. So Satan will try to take your eyes away. Let me hear you say amen. There was a king many years ago, a young king, who just took the throne. He ascended the throne of his father. And this young king. He was very ambitious. And he surrounded himself with young advisors. Young counselors. And the young people that he surrounded himself with. They said to him. Let's invade the kingdom. That's next door. And when you invade that kingdom. You can annex that kingdom into this kingdom. And you can go in and conquer the entire, you know, territory. And you can be the biggest king in the, in the place. And then he, he, he took the advice of the young, ambitious counselors. And you know what he did, man of God? He went ahead and he invaded that city. And it so happened that the old king, who was more powerful and greater than he was, and of course wiser, he was able to defeat him in battle. And they captured and they defeated his entire kingdom. And they captured this new king, this young king. And they brought him to the palace of the old king. And he looked at him and he laughed. And the old king said, I see my old self in you. Ambitious when I was young at the throne, I was also ambitious. I thought I could go here and go there. And I lacked wisdom. You also lack wisdom. And I'm going to teach you wisdom today. He said, Listen, 
I'll take you to the arena and you're going to hold a spoon. And in that spoon, you're going to have water in the spoon. And you're going to cross across one end of the arena to the other. And people are going to be calling your names right, left, and center. And if for whatever reason, one drop of the water was to hit the ground, I will execute you right there. I will cut off your head. But if for whatever reason, you could go through from one end of the arena to the next, without one drop of the water falling to the ground, I will restore you back to your kingdom. That's your test. And he said, would you do it? He said, have no choice. So he put people in the arena, right, left, and center, and they were all shouting his name, calling his name. And they gave him the spoon, and he put water in the spoon. And this young king with shame in his head, he took that spoon, and he walked his way, one step at a time, through the crowd, yelling, and some of them cursing at him. Some of them just saying terrible things about him. Some of them praising him. Some of them saying, don't worry, there's going to be another day. Some encouraging him, great, all kind of stuff. You know what? He held on his ground. And he went all the way from the beginning to the end. And he came back. And there was not one drop of the water that fell to the ground. And the old king asked him to come back to the palace. And he said to him, tell me, how were you not able to spill one, blow, one uh, drop of the water? And he said, because I shut myself off from the voices of the people. I listened to the voices of my inner man. And I told myself, I will get my kingdom again. I will get my kingdom again. I will get my kingdom again. And that's what kept me through. And the man said to him, if you have done that in the first place, you will not be here. <laughs> because the young advisors, they twisted your head and they took you off of course say go back now and build your kingdom and oftentimes we allow the things that are around us to take us away from the will of God do you know many times that God will speak to you to do something the Lord will say to you I want you to uh, do something for my kingdom I want you to start this assignment but as you start there will be voices there will be people clamoring you. There will be people criticizing you. There will be people talking down at you. There will be things you did not bargain for that will show off its head. In order to take your eyes away from the goal. In order to discourage you from succeeding at that marriage. In order to stop you from building that work God has put in your hand. All kinds of voices will come. Voices of accusations, voices of fear, voices of anxiety, voices of criticism, whatever it is, keep your eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Paul the apostle said, I have one habit. I constantly forget the things that are behind me. I forget the things that I've been through. I forget the pain of the past. God is speaking to somebody right now. I forget the things that others have done against me. I forget every time I, I, I sleep and I get up in the morning, I forget what people said or did against me last night. I keep my eyes on the goal. Paul said, I keep my eyes on Jesus. I have to finish the race that God has given me. Let me hear somebody say amen tonight. So those who are empowered by God, they walk in the strength of God and they understand they cannot take their eyes away from what God has called them to do. So what do you have to do? You have to be like that young king. Look at my eyes, everybody. You know you have to be like that young king? You have to walk through that arena. You have to hold that drop, that, that, that water in the spoon. And you have to walk through that arena. Am I talking to somebody right now? You're walking through the arena of life. And there's all these voices in your head. You have to see the end in your face. You have to see the will of God in your face. You have to see the greatness God is calling you to attain in your face. And that is the only thing that matters. The only thing that matters is the will of God. All of this noise does not matter. It does not bother me. 
Number one thing, God wants you to be like that king and filter things out of your spirit. The greatest place you can be is in the will of God within the parameters of your own spirit. Am I talking to somebody tonight? The wonderful, the most amazing place in your life is in the secret place of the Most High. Under the shadow of the Almighty. Where you and God strike the deal. I love that place. Every time God asks me to do something, it's never made sense to people. And that's why I know that at the beginning of every vision, I have to continue to dwell in the secret place. And when I stay there long enough, and I begin to download what God is saying to me, when I start to share it with people, it's already clear. Can I hear someone say amen? It's already clear. It's open to me. And if you don't understand, too bad for you. I'm going to do what God called me to do anyways. Listen to me, child of God. God is calling you to stay focused and to filter things out of your life. Number one, he wants you to filter people out of your spirit space who are not in tune and in line with the perfect will of God. He wants you to filter them out. Look at my eyes, somebody. He is calling you now to recognize that not everybody can go with you to your next level. Not everybody is relevant in your next level. See, I love the Wednesday class because it lets me really pour revelation into you. See, for a Sunday night, we could do a lot of exciting teaching, I mean preaching and praying and prophecy, but tonight you got to learn the principles of the kingdom. Because as I look across this room, I see greatness in each person. And many times we start something, we're not able to finish it. Because we have not filtered the wrong people out of our lives. Many people are consuming your space and your time. They are taking every energy in your spirit out of you. You are using the energy you should use to grow to fight. Using the same energy you should use to grow, hallelujah, to defend yourself. To prove a point. To get accepted. To, to prove yourself right. You don't need that energy. One of the things you need to understand is that you need to be in the secret place. See, I love the way the Bible puts it. Some of the times we read the Bible, we don't understand the context of what we are reading. Okay, look at my eyes, everybody. When you say something is secret, that means it's what? That means it's what? It's hidden. It's a secret place. What does it mean to be a secret place? Can I ask you a question? Is this church now a secret place? Is it a secret place? It's not a secret place. Why is this not a secret place? Because we advertise the address. <laughs> because it's on the internet. It's not a, I don't want to have a secret place church. <laughs> I want to have an open place church. Amen. If it's a secret place, nobody knows about it. It's like, really? Where you meeting? No, you can know. You can know. You know, you can know. 6819 Stills Avenue. <laughs> Toronto West, that's where we are. It's not a secret place. Come on, somebody say amen. But if I have somebody or somewhere that I go, maybe two days in the month, to pray alone, and I want to be there with God, and I don't want nobody except my wife to know the place. What's that place? Secret place. It's my hideout with God. So scripture says, he that dwell in the secret place of the Most High. So what, what does that mean? It means God is saying, hmm, the place of destiny is a lonely place. I just blessed somebody right there. There's a season in destiny where you are by yourself with God. Okay. Is there somebody trying to fit in now? You're trying to bring a crowd to your secret place. You can't bring a crowd to your secret place. If you were to bring a crowd there, it's no more a secret place. Nobody can follow you into the blueprint of God's will for your life. It is a secret place. You are in God's secret place. I am in God's secret place. God takes me from face to face, layer to layer, into hideout. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in you. Take me where the crowd cannot come. Bring me to your hideout. Bring me to your closer place. Bring me to your secret place. You help me to filter distractions out of my life. See, many years ago, the Lord told me, 
He said, the things that I've called you to do are not complex. It's the things that I've not called you to do that you are doing that makes what I've called you to do complex. Am I talking to somebody right now? Okay, I'm going to say that again. He said, what I've called you to do is not what? Are you with me, man of God? What I've called you to do is not what? It's not complex. But the things that I've called you to do, I've not called you that, that is occupying your space, is complex. I know God has not called me to gossip, for example. Praise God. I know God has not called me to do what? I know God has not called me to gossip. I know God has not called me to compete with any man. I know God has not called me to live my life to prove other people wrong. I know God has not called me, hallelujah, to try to impress people. You see why well, I'm happy? I know God has not called me to impress you. He has not called me to try to prove a point. He has not called me to compete with people. I know God has not called me to gossip. I know God has not called me to, and that's why I don't get into tabloids. I say, who is happening? Who is raving? Who is the bestest? Who is the highest? It's none of my business. You know what God has called me to do? To preach, to pray. To what? Preach and what? Pray. Preach, pray. Preach, pray. Preach, pray. Every day I preach, I pray. And when I stay focused on preaching and praying, I stay successful. Am I talking to somebody right now? It's not complex. We live what we are called to do. And we do the things we're not called to do. Somebody, God called you to serve in church. And somebody doesn't like you. And you know it's possible for you to leave your entire assignment. And to be about who doesn't like you in church. And you look about three months. You've not even done what you are called to do by God. You are doing everything to make this person that doesn't like you look bad. And that's not even your assignment. <laughs> Filter people out of your life. Out of your secret place. Filter people out. Somebody say, I filter, I filter. The, wrong the wrong people out of my private space. My private space. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Hallelujah. Because you have to be focused. You know that? You understand that? You have to be what? You got to be focused. Number two, filter projects, projects out of your space that is not part of God's word, will for your life. Am I talking to somebody? Filter what? Projects. Am I talking to somebody? Say, I filter projects out of my life that's not God's will for my life. Look at mine, somebody. You know how you can be busy doing a project that's not God's will for your life. You know how they came to Jesus and they told him to multiply bread again after he multiplied the bread the first time. And they want to tell Jesus to bakery. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus said, well, you know what? I did multiply the bread when I preached to the people in the desert and they were hungry and they were going to die. But because Jesus can multiply bread does not mean every service. The Bible... He goes about multiplying bread. Brrr. Let's multiply bread. Brrr. And every time he says, whenever you Jesus go to preach somewhere, there's free bread. No. <laughs> Twice. I, I, am I talking to somebody? Twice in the ministry of Jesus, he multiplied bread. Did he have the power to multiply bread every time? Did he multiply bread every time? You know why he did not multiply bread every time? Because if Jesus was to multiply bread every time, all they'll be doing is bread ministry. <laughs> there'll be no, no teaching for the word of God. In fact, some people will be teaching them like, you know what, we can't wait for the bread part. Just <laughs> get through with this whole teaching and let's get to the main event, the bread. Okay, the bread. Bread and butter part. Boom. Yeah, that's the ministry. It would defeat the purpose of the kingdom. There would be projects in your life that is not part of God's will for you. And some of them will come to you. Some people will walk to you and say, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? 
Do you know how many times I get a call or I get an email or I get something really fancy and somebody said to me, you, you, you ought to be doing this, apostle. You ought to be doing this. You Because on the level that God has brought you, you ought to be doing this. And I said, no, thank you. No, thank you. It's not what I'm called to do now. I might come to it later, but right now, it's not on my to-do list. Am I talking to somebody? It's not what? On my to-do list. And you know what? Whenever somebody says something that God is calling me to do in that moment, I don't let them go. I hold them down. God is calling me to do that. Tell me more about it. What do you know about that? Because that's on my list of to-do things. You got to wake up every morning and say to God, I filter projects out of my life. Projects that you're not calling me to do. Projects that's going to wear me thin. That's not part of what God wants me to do. Imagine you did something for 16 months. And then you find out you don't even need it. You know how some people will go and do a degree. Praise God. And they, and they spend all that money and they come out and say, I, I don't want it anymore. What? What were you thinking? Were you walking in the will of God? You are a woman of God. You are a man of God. You are a man on a mission. You can't live reactive. You must be proactive. Filter projects out of your life. Whenever somebody is asking you to do something, you need to ask God, do you want me to do this right now? Do you want me to do this? And I believe I've gotten to a point in my work with God that I don't even have to pray about what God wants me to do. I just hear it. I say, no, it's not a lie. Because I have become the embodiment of my own assignment. Am I talking to somebody? I'm the walking reflection of my own assignment. I'm the embodiment of my own destiny. I'm the embodiment of my own ministry. So the moment you start to tell me what should be done, and it's not aligned with what God said to me, I just started to say, uh-uh, mm -mm. The bell in my heart is not ringing. Uh-uh, uh-uh, this is not it. And the moment that is it, I say, yes, yes, I like that. Because I know I've got a short time. We all have short time. We don't live forever. You got to do only what God called you to do. Let me hear you say amen. amen. You got to do what God called you to do. Filter projects. Number three, filter out the wrong places out of your life. Especially if you live in Toronto. You want to be sure if you are caught in the traffic, 401 traffic, you are coming to church. You want to be sure if you are caught in the traffic, whatever is taking you into that long traffic is meaningful to your destiny. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Honestly, I, I moved my, my last place where I was living into a closer place because I realized by staying on the highway or by staying on the traffic for an extra hour in a day or two hours a day is 14 hours a week. 14 by 4 is what? 56 hours. So I'm on the road for two days in a month. I said, no, Lord. This cannot continue. <laughs> this has to stop. <laughs> I said, I can't do two hours. Two days on the road. In a month, two days. That's why I moved. I moved to somewhere close to church. Why? So I don't do two hours of my life in a month on the road. Let me hear you say amen. amen. I can't be going places. Some people call me and say, Pastor, would you like to come here? Would you like to go to that place? Would you like to go to some place? And I'll tell you something, Toronto is big. If I follow everybody everywhere they want me to go, <laughs> especially when you pastor a church, and everybody has some amazing things they want to show you. And someone say, would you want me to show you this? We know I will never have time for ministry. Can I hear you say amen? amen. So you got to go places that are only connected to a God-given assignment. Am I talking to somebody? God is calling you to go to some places. And there are places God does not want you to go. There are so many of y'all, you are in every social gathering. Because somebody said to you, don't worry, when it's your own time for your own party, somebody's going to come. <laughs> don't worry, I will come. You got to focus on your God-given assignment. We waste too much time and too much going everywhere. In a big city, you go drive east and drive west. Sometimes you could be on the road for two hours and it's still not connected to your God-given assignment. 
Am I talking to somebody? Redeeming the time. Look at my people of God. What does it mean to redeem the time? What does it mean to redeem the time? To buy back your time. Redeeming your time. Means you are negotiating your time. I'm buying my time when I moved out and I bought back two days of my life from being on the road. I redeem my time. I redeem my time. You got to redeem your time. Redeem your life. Glory to God. Redeem your life. Why? Because you're a man on a mission. You're a woman on a mission. You are called to make a difference. And it's important that you don't miss your target. Is God talking to somebody right now? Two days or three days ago was the middle of the year. The middle of the what? It was the middle of the year. It was the middle of the year. And somebody sent me a message and said, Today, right now, right now, today is the middle of 2018. And that hit me, boom, like a tornado. And I jumped to the back. And I sat down in my washroom, in my, not wash, yeah, in the washroom. I sat down on the bath, the whatever, the, what do you call that? Thing? Yeah, the bathtub, thank you. I sat down there and I said to myself, oh my God, how time flies. And I started to think back. On what God told me we'll do in our ministry this year. And I said to God, I thank you for what you've done. But what will I be saying by December? Because the Lord told me that he was not only going to start a church in Toronto, but he was going to also start a church in Scarborough. And instantly I heard the Lord say to me, if you do not start the Scarborough church now, the year is soon going to go. Especially given your very, very end of the year activity in Toronto. And instantly I got up. I said, Lord, I'm going to start. You know why I did that? Because I was hit with the reality that is the, begin, is the middle of the year. And I know I'm going to do a church in Scarborough and another church in Hamilton this year. Let me hear you say amen. Amen. So today I was in Scarborough looking for a view. And I found a view. <laughs> and I've been talking with my wife about that. We've been having some chit chat because we are going to have a movement bigger than, okay, not bigger. Toronto is bigger. But a, a movement also in Scarborough. And we're starting, okay, why am I saying not big? I don't know the will of God because I'm on the altar. Let your will be done. But we are starting a movement as well in where? Scarborough. In Scarborough. The building has been seen. I'm believing God for that building. I'm going to get that building by the end of next week. Amen. We're going to get that building by the end of next week. And we're going to invade that region. And this place will continue to grow by God's grace. And Scarborough is going to explode. Amen. And the Scarborough building, all things being equal, is on, it's as big as this building. I know, say wow. wow. Don't miss a good place to say, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Listen, listen. People call you crazy every time. They go, they call me crazy to stop the rolling camera. There's no need. The sound is not going in. People always call me crazy and stop the stream. They call me what? Crazy. Look at my eyes. You got to understand the DNA of the spirit that you have. Mm -hmm. You got to know it. You are not just.